So recently, Jeff Bosky reached out to me over YouTube asking if I could do some Pyro Solver analysis of some of the hands he's been playing over at Cash Games at the Win Encore. And I said, yeah, sure, I'm totally interested. But then I thought, this dude looks kind of familiar. And then my immediate thought was, yo, did you play Magic the Gathering? And as you can probably see from this YouTube page, yeah, this dude plays Magic the Gathering. And in fact, Brian Weissman is one of the original master vintage players of the game. So it's crazy looking back and reuniting with different personalities from different competitive games in my life. And it's also funny thinking, wow, I thought that Magic the Gathering was just going to be an innocent hobby that I picked up when I was 12 years old, and it turned out to be a gateway drug to a crippling gambling addiction as an adult. Who would have thought? Anyway, Jeff showed me some hands that he recently played that he's going to be featuring in his vlog, and I wanted to do some pile analysis of these hands, particularly with a hand that starts with a down bet that I actually disagree on. So first, let's take a look at the hand. It's a 2-5 game. Hero is 580 effective, and under the gun plus 2, he opens at $20 or 4 big blinds, which is fine and definitely the raising size that you should be using in a field of recreational players who are going to call too often, because you're simply going to inflate the pot against them pre-flop, which not only gives you equity advantage for your strong hands, but you also make a lot of money by stealing a lot of inflated pots post-flop. So the small blind calls, and Jeff's note is that the small blind is going to be kind of a recreational player, but he has Jeff covered. The flop comes queen 2-2, two, two, the small blind checks, and hero bets $15 into $45, villain calls. The turn is a 6, the small blind checks, hero bets 40 into $75, and then gets check raised a little bit more than minimum to 105, which hero calls. The river is about 220, it comes a jack, which is kind of a blank, and the villain bets 130 into 220, which hero then calls. So let's first talk about how I think you should ideally play this hand. First, let's look at the opening range that I've given Jeff. I haven't asked Jeff what his early position opening ranges are going to be like in a full ring game, but I assume it's generally going to include 7s and 8s plus, most of the suited aces, the stronger suited broadways, ace-queen, and then he might be opening some of the weaker off-suit and suited hands, some of the lower pocket pairs, depending on his control of the board and how bad he thinks that the blinds are. If this was a spot where I thought that the small blind was particularly bad, opening 6s would probably be pretty standard. Because because the small blind is a recreational player, I've given him a range that includes some pocket pairs, some of the suited aces, some of the weaker suited broadway hands, and also some strong flats with like aces, ace king, kings, and queens, which will represent some of his slow plays. But for the most part, he's going to be having a lot of these middle-ish pocket pairs. And he should have most of the lower pocket pairs, but he might occasionally fold those. But so in this model, you could generalize it as being 15% versus a narrow and capped 9%. So first, let's build a tree allowing the in-position player to bet 20, 50, or 100 just to get kind of a baseline EV that we can use later on. Okay, I finished the sim running 25, 50, 100 sizing. And first, our EV in position is 27, 18. So that's going to be the baseline that we're going to be looking for when we're comparing other strategy. Our opponent checks to us. And as you can see, if given the option between betting a quarter, a half, and pot, Pio definitely prefers pot. So this is definitely a spot where you can just bet 15 into 45. If you range bet here with nuts advantages, you're definitely going to be doing fine. And you can see that even when you bet a quarter here, your opponents are not going to be able to call often enough to meet minimum defense frequencies. They still have to overfold at least 5% of the time, and in reality, they're going to be overfolding more. I think in reality, when you're under the gun plus two, if you bet a quarter here, you're going to get hands like king 10 of hearts or king jack of clubs to fold on the flop so you can definitely see even from the 11 bet that it's going to definitely be immediately profitable however when you're under the gun when you don't have full board coverage you generally have to polarize your strategy a little bit more if you're if you don't have twos threes fours and fives and a board comes 2-4 jack for example you're not going to be able to simplify your entire range there so generally, any spot where I think, oh, I should be polarizing my strategy, I'm going to be looking to either be betting very large or checking more often. And generally, boards that are very, very uncoordinated, hard to hit, and going to be very good for the under-the-gun raiser, I can also think about sizing up. 
So here, let's see what EV we're going to get if we just depole the flop. So here, as this begins to solve down, you can see that we're picking up 26.63 when we bet a third. So definitely going to be within the tolerance of EV loss that we use when we employ simplifications. However, let's see what kind of EV we're going to get if we depole 50 on the flop instead. So as this almost solves down, you can see that this is a 17 set improvement over depoling 33. And it's not an extreme difference, but it still shows you that you can actually consider larger depole sizes when you have a very tight range. There's definitely going to be some flops like Ace King 9, where you can probably get away with depoling 66 or more. And in fact, that actually might be the optimal strategy in the first place. If you give Pio the option of checking or betting 66, there's definitely some boards where it wants to bet 100% of the time. So as you can see, sizing up is a small improvement. But also, if we use mixed sizings and give Pio the option of betting 100%, it wants to bet 100%. And I think that this is a spot where if you think the small blind is a kind of a recreational player, you probably should just be potting it yourself. And I think going for an extremely greedy line is actually the best way to proceed here. From both a theoretical perspective and an exploitive perspective, I probably just go ahead and start with a pot size bet. But if I didn't know anything about my opponent, I might go for a deep hole 50 or some kind of mix sizing strategy, especially because I like to mix it up between deep polling and using mixed strategies when I feel like I have a good control over the texture. But let's see what play looks like after you start with a deep pull 33. So after we bet 15 and call, the turn is a 6 and our opponent checks to us. Even as the solver is solving down, you can already see that if we give Pyo the option of two bet sizes between 50 and 94, that is two thirds or an overbet, it definitely is going to prefer the overbet sizing, especially after we've bet 33 on the flop and really kept our opponent's range very wide. The six is a generally good card for us. I think that there's some possibility that we open sixes pre-flop and because we range bet the flop, we still have sixes on our turn range. It's possible that our opponent might shed pocket sixes either by open folding in the small blind pre-flop, or he might fold some combinations of sixes to a range bet on the flop, particularly sixes that don't have the six of diamonds. And so it's possible that your opponent is extremely discounted from having nuttish hands by the turn. And you'll kind of see that reflected in the sizing here. In the actual game, Jeff errs on a smaller sizing. And again, I think generally against recreational players, I just like to go for greed, especially because after you depole 15 on the flop, your opponent might just be confused about what you have and then start getting really sticky. Let's say we pick the smaller bet size and our opponent puts in a small raise. Here, our opponent should be raising sixes occasionally. Aces and kings, if you slow played them both pre and post flop. A tiny speckling of ace queen and then some occasional just random shots with equity. Villain's range should really not have many nuttish type hands, and so it's also possible that villains should really not have any kind of raising range here at all. But again, recreational players don't really care about balance, and as you can see, well, if this player does have kings, they definitely should be check raising here on the turn. Facing a raise, hero should pretty much always call when he has a queen x type hand, call when he has aces, kings, and queens, and then call with some of his nut flush draws. Though curiously, if you bet ace 9 or ace 10, those diamonds are going to be folds more often than if you bet, say, ace 4. This probably has to do with what exact combinations of diamonds that the villain will turn into a bluff, and in practice, you probably should just always call with ace 9, ace 10, and ace jack of diamonds here. Notice here, there's no particular reason to re-raise, especially when Hero holds the Ace of Diamonds himself and then blocks his opponent from holding a lot of these kind of fancy turn check raises. So Hero calls, and the river is the Jack of Spades. Now, in this river model, the stack sizes are a little bit off because on the turn we bet 50 instead of 40, but you can very clearly see when given the option between two bet sizes, the times villains should bet, villains should just shove and very rarely should have a quote unquote standard betting size. By the time you get to the river, if you take a line where you call the flop, check, raise the turn, usually by the river you just have a ton of really, really nutted type hands and you want to just put all of the money in. So it doesn't really make sense to check, raise the turn and then bet like two thirds on the river. However, for this analysis, let's create a subtree configuration and see what happens if our opponent only is allowed to bet 66 on the river. 
So this is what villain's betting range should look like, but also keep in mind this is incredibly distorted because this is only representing five combos of your opponent's entire range, because really they shouldn't be check raising the turn very often. It's not that useful to look at what your opponent's betting range is, it's kind of more useful to see what hands fall into the defense frequency based on your opponent's bet sizings. So after your opponent min check raises the turn, bets two thirds on the river, you should be trimming some theoretical percentage of hands, and it's interesting to see then what hands fall into your calling down range. So if your opponent bets two thirds here, you should obviously shove queens and jacks, shove pocket deuces, a6 seems to be a good shove because it blocks your opponent's most likely turn check raising hand, and generally hands like aces and kings are going to be calls on the river. Though very noticeably, you'd rather not hold the king of diamonds, because that's going to block a lot of your opponent's turn bluff check raising. So definitely no reason to shove pocket aces here, and in the actual hand, Jeff calls and his opponent shows him pocket kings, which is kind of a cooler because they should have just gotten it all in pre-flop. However, this is also a spot where if Jeff bet 33 on the flop, then 125 on the turn, and then shoved the river, he probably would have got stacks in as well. Or if he had bet 50 on the flop, potted the turn, and then shoved on the river, he probably would have gotten it as well. So kind of bad luck in that his opponent didn't fast play his hand more. But very often when you are taking GTO type lines, when you start the flop with a one third bet, you're often going to start putting in a ton of pressure which means putting in aces by the river even in single raised pots. So moral of this story is when you're under the gun, when you have very tight ranges, when the flop texture does not crush your opponent, you definitely can think about sizing up even more than just one third, even with your entire range. Anyway, I thought this hand was pretty interesting from a flop betting size perspective, and it just goes to show that deep pull 33 is not the be all end all. There definitely are other strategies that you can be taking, particularly when you think that your opponent is somewhat recreational. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and check out my cash game system over at OvernightMonster.com. As always, good luck, and I'll see you next week with more hands and more pyo analysis.